Hero Myths of the British Race From Bullfinch's The Age of Chivalry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads The Age of Chivalry by Thomas Bullfinch Hero Myths of the British Race Beowulf Notable among the names of heroes of the British race is that of Beowulf, which appeals to all English-speaking people in a very special way, since he is the one hero in whose story we may see the ideals of our English forefathers before they left their continental home to cross to the islands of Britain. Although this hero has distinguished himself by numerous feats of strength during his boyhood and early youth, it was as the deliverer of Hrothgar, king of Denmark, from the monster Grendel, that he first gained wide renown. Grendel was half monster and half man, and had his abode in the fen fastnesses in the vicinity of Hrothgar's residence. Night after night he would steal into the king's great palace called Hararot, and slay sometimes as many as thirty at one time of the knights sleeping there. Beowulf put himself at the head of a selected band of warriors, went against the monster, and after a terrible fight slew it. The following night Grendel's mother, a fiend scarcely less terrible than her son, carried off one of Hrothgar's boldest thanes. Once more Beowulf went to the help of the Danish king, followed the she-monster to her lair at the bottom of a muddy lake in the midst of the swamp, and with his good sword hrunting and his own muscular arms, broke the sea-woman's neck. Upon his return to his own country of the Geats, loaded with honors bestowed upon him by Hrothgar, Beowulf served the king of Geatland as the latter's most trusted counsellor and champion. When, after many years, the king fell before an enemy, the Geats unanimously chose Beowulf for their new king. His fame as a warrior kept his country free from invasion, and his wisdom as a statesman increased its prosperity and happiness. In the fiftieth year of Beowulf's reign, however, a great terror fell upon the land in the way of a monstrous fire-dragon, which flew forth by night from its den in the rocks, lighting up the blackness with its blazing breath, and burning houses and homesteads, men and cattle, with the flames from its mouth. When the news came to Beowulf that his people were suffering and dying, and that no warrior dared to risk his life in an effort to deliver the country from this deadly devastation, the aged king took up his shield and sword and went forth to his last fight. At the entrance of the dragon's cave, Beowulf raised his voice and shouted a furious defiance to the awesome guardian of the den. Roaring hideously and napping his glowing wings together, the dragon rushed forth and half flew, half sprang on Beowulf. Then began a fearful combat, which ended in Beowulf's piercing the dragon's scaly armor and inflicting a mortal wound. But alas, in himself being given a gash in the neck by the opponent's poisoned fangs, which resulted in his death. As he lay stretched on the ground, his head supported by Wiglaf, an honored warrior who had helped in the fight with the dragon, Beowulf roused himself to say, as he grasped Wiglif's hand, Thou must now look to the needs of the nation. Here dwell I no longer, for destiny calleth me. Bid thou my warriors, after my funeral pyre, build me a burial cairn high on the sea-cliff's head, so that the seafarers Beowulf's barrel henceforth shall name it, they who drive far and wide over the mighty flood their foamy keels. Thou art the last of all the kindred of Wagmund. Wired has swept all my kin, all the brave chiefs away. Now must I follow them. These last words spoken, the king of the Geats, brave to seek danger and brave to look on death and fate undaunted, fell back dead. According to his last desires, his followers gathered wood and piled it on the cliff head. Upon this funeral pyre was laid Beowulf's body and consumed to ashes. Then upon the same cliff of Heronsness was erected a huge burial cairn, widespread and lofty, to be known thereafter as Beowulf's Barrow. Cuchulain, Champion of Ireland Among all the early literatures of Europe, there are two which, at exactly opposite corners of the continent, display most strikingly similar characteristics. These are the Greek and the Irish, and the legend of the Irish champion Cuchulain, which well illustrates the similarity of the literatures, bears so close a resemblance to the story of Achilles, as to win for this hero the title of the Irish Achilles. Certainly in reckless courage, power of inspiring dread, sense of personal merit, and frankness of speech, the Irish hero is fully equal to the mighty Greek. 
who Chulin was the nephew of King Connor of Ulster, son of his sister Dectyre, and it is said that his father was no mortal man, but the great god Lu of the Longhand. Cuchulain was brought up by King Connor himself, and even while he was still a boy his fame spread all over Ireland. His warlike deeds were those of a proved warrior, not of a child of nursery age, and by the time Cuchulain was seventeen he was without peer among the champions of Ulster. Upon Cuchulain's marriage to Emer, daughter of Forgal the Wily, a druid of great power, the couple took up their residence at Armagh, the capital of Ulster, under the protection of King Connor. Here there was one chief, Bracryu of the Bitter Tongue, who, like Thersites among the Grecian leaders, delighted in making mischief. Soon he had on foot plans for stirring up strife among the heroes of Ulster, leaders among whom were the mighty Laguerre, Connell Cernach, cousin of Cuchulain, and Cuchulain himself. Inviting the members of King Connor's court to dinner, Bracryu arranged that a contest should arise over who should have the champion's portion, and so successful was he that, to avoid a bloody fight, the three heroes mentioned decided to submit their claims to the championship of Ireland to King Ail Ail of Connaught. Ail Ail put the heroes to an unexpected test. Their dinner was served them in a separate room, into which three magic beasts, in the shape of monstrous cats, were sent by the king. When they saw them, Laguerre and Connell rose from their meal, climbed among the rafters, and stayed there all night. Cuchulain waited until one cat attacked him, and then, drawing his sword, struck the monster. It showed no further sign of fight, and at daybreak the magic beast disappeared. As Laguerre and Connell claimed that this test was an unfair one, Al Il sent the three rivals to Curoy of Kiri, a just and wise man, who set out to discover by wizardry and enchantments the best among the heroes. In turn they stood watch outside Curoy's castle, where Laguerre and Connell were overcome by a huge giant, who hurled spears of mighty oak trees, and ended by throwing them over the wall into the courtyard. Cuchulain alone withstood the giant, whereupon he was attacked by other magic foes. Among these was a dragon, who flew on horrible wings from a neighboring lake, and seemed ready to devour everything in its way. Cuchulain sprang up, giving his wonderful hero leap, thrust his arm into the dragon's mouth and down its throat, and tore out its heart. After the monster fell dead, he cut off its scaly head. As even yet Cuchulain's opponents would not admit his championship, they were all three directed to return to Armagh to await Kuroi's judgment. Here it happened that all the Ulster heroes were in the great hall one night, except Cuchulain and his cousin Connell. As they sat in order of rank, a terrible stranger, gigantic in stature, hideous in aspect, with ravening yellow eyes, entered. In his hand he bore an enormous axe with keen and shining edge. Upon King Connor's inquiring his business there, the stranger replied, Behold my axe! The man who will grasp it to-day may cut my head off with it, provided that I may, in like manner, cut off his head to-morrow. If you have no champion who dare face me, I will say that Ulster has lost her courage and is dishonored. At once Laguerre accepted the challenge. The giant laid his head on a block, and at a blow the hero severed it from the body. Thereupon the giant arose, took the head in the axe, and thus, headless, strode from the hall. But the following night, when he returned, sound as ever, to claim the fulfillment of Laguerre's promise, the latter's heart failed him, and he did not come forward. The stranger then jeered at the men of Ulster, because their great champion durst not keep his agreement, nor face the blow he should receive in return for the one he gave. The men of Ulster were utterly ashamed. But Connell Cernach, who was present that night, made a new agreement with the stranger. He gave a blow which beheaded the giant, but again, when the latter returned whole and sound on the following evening, the champion was not to be found. Now it was the turn of Cuchulain, who, as the others had done, cut off the giant's head at one stroke. The next day the members of Connor's court watched Cuchulain to see what he would do. They would not have been surprised if he had failed like the others who were now present. The champion, however, showed no signs of failing or retreat. He sat sorrowfully in his place, and with a sigh said to King Connor as they waited, Do not leave this place till all is over. Death is coming to me very surely, but I must fulfill my agreement, for I would rather die than break my word. Towards the close of day the stranger strode into the hall exultant. Where is Cuchulain? he cried. Here I am, was the reply. Ah, poor boy, your speech is sad tonight. 
and the fear of death lies heavy upon you. But at least you have redeemed your word, and have not failed me. The youth rose from his seat and went towards him, as he stood with the great axe ready, and knelt to receive the blow. The hero of Ulster laid his head on the block, but the giant was not satisfied. Stretch out your neck better, said he. You are playing with me, to torment me, said Cuchulain. Slay me now speedily, for I did not keep you waiting last night. However, he stretched out his neck as ordered, and the stranger raised his axe till it crashed upwards through the rafters of the hall, like the crash of trees falling in a storm. When the axe came down with a terrific sound, all men looked fearfully at Cuchulain. The descending axe had not even touched him. It had come down with the blunt side on the ground, and the youth knelt there unharmed. Smiling at him and leaning on his axe, stood no terrible and hideous stranger, but Kuroi of Kerry, come to give his decision at last. "'Rise up, Cuchulain, said Kuroi. "'There is none among all the heroes of Ulster to equal you in courage and loyalty and truth. The championship of the heroes of Ireland is yours from this day forth and the champion's portion at all feasts, and to your wife I adjudge the first place among all the women of Ulster. Woe to him who dares to dispute this decision. Thereupon Kuroi vanished, and the warriors gathered around Cuchulain, and all with one voice acclaimed him the champion of the heroes of all Ireland, a title which has clung to him until this day. This is one of the many stories told of the Irish champion, whose deeds of bravery would fill many pages. Cuchulain finally came to his end on the field of battle, after a fight in which he displayed all his usual gallantry, but in which unfair means were used to overcome him. For Wales and for England during centuries Arthur has been the representative very gentle perfect knight. In a similar way, in England's sister isle, Cuchulain stands ever for the highest ideals of the Irish Gales. Hereward the Wake In Hereward the Wake, or Watchful, is found one of those heroes whose date can be ascertained with a fair amount of exactness, and yet in whose story occur mythological elements which seem to belong to all ages. The folklore of primitive races is a great storehouse whence a people can choose tales and heroic deeds to glorify its own national hero, careless that the same tales and deeds have done duty for other peoples and other heroes. Hence it happens that hereward the Saxon, a patriot hero as real and actual as Nelson or George Washington, whose deeds were recorded in prose and verse within forty years of his death, was even then surrounded by a cloud of romance and mystery, which hid in vagueness his family, his marriage, and even his death. Briefly it may be stated that Hereward was a native of Lincolnshire, and was in his prime about 1070. In that year he joined a party of Danes who appeared in England, attacked Peterborough, and sacked the abbey there, and afterward took refuge in the Isle of Ely. Here he was besieged by William the Conqueror, and was finally forced to yield to the Norman. He thus came to stand for the defeated Saxon race, and his name has been passed down as that of the darling hero of the Saxons. For his splendid defense of Ely, they forgave his final surrender to Duke William. They attributed to him all the virtues supposed to be inherent in the freeborn and all the glorious valor on which the English prided themselves. And lastly, they surrounded his death with a halo of desperate fighting, and made his last conflict as wonderful as that of Roland at Roncesvalles. If Roland is the ideal of Norman feudal chivalry, Hereward is equally the ideal of Anglo-Saxon sturdy manliness and knighthood. An account of one of Hereward's adventures as a youth will serve as illustration of the stories told of his prowess. On an enforced visit to Cornwall, he found that King Ayla, a petty British chief, had betrothed his fair daughter to a terrible Pictish giant, breaking off, in order to do it, her troth plight with Prince Sigtrig of Waterford, son of a Danish king in Ireland. Hereward, ever chivalrous, picked a quarrel with the giant, and killed him in fair fight, whereupon the king threw him into prison. In the following night, however, the released princess arranged that the gallant Saxon should be freed and sent hot-foot for her lover, Prince Sigtrig. After many adventures, Hereward reached the prince, who hastened to return to Cornwall with the young hero. But to the grief of both, they learned upon their arrival that the princess had just been betrothed to a wild Cornish hero, Haco, and the wedding feast was to be held that very day. Sigtrig at once sent a troop of forty Danes to King Ayla 
demanding the fulfillment of the troth plight between himself and his daughter, and threatening vengeance if it were broken. To this threat the king returned no answer, and no Dane came back to tell of their reception. Sigtrig would have waited till morning, trusting in the honor of the king, but hereward disguised himself as a minstrel, and obtained admission to the bridal feast, where he soon won applause by his beautiful singing. The bridegroom Haco, in a rapture, offered him any boon he liked to ask, but he demanded only a cup of wine from the hands of the bride. When she brought it to him, he flung into the empty cup the betrothal ring, the token she had sent to Sigtrig, and said, I thank thee, lady, and would reward thee for thy gentleness to a wandering minstrel. I give back the cup, richer than before by the kind thoughts of which it bears the token. The princess looked at him, gazed into the goblet, and saw her ring. Then, looking again, she recognized her deliverer, and knew that rescue was at hand. While men feasted, Hereward listened and talked, and found out that the forty Danes were prisoners, to be released on the morrow, when Haco was sure of his bride, but released useless and miserable, since they would be turned adrift blinded. Haco was taking his lovely bride back to his own land, and Hereward saw that any rescue, to be successful, must be attempted on the march. Returning to Sigtrig, the young Saxon told all that he had learned, and the Danes planned an ambush in the ravine where Haco had decided to blind and set free his captives. The whole was carried out exactly as Hereward arranged it. The Cornish men, with the Danish captives, passed first without attack. Next came Haco, riding grim and ferocious beside his silent bride, he exulting in his success, she looking eagerly for any signs of rescue. As they passed, Hereward sprang from his shelter, crying, Upon them, Danes, and set your brethren free! And himself struck down Haco and smote off his head. There was a short struggle, but soon the rescued Danes were able to aid their deliverers, and the Cornish guards were all slain. The men of King Aleph, never very zealous for the cause of Haco, fled, and the Danes were left masters of the field. Sigtrig had in the meantime seen to the safety of the princess, and now, placing her between himself and Hereward, he escorted her to the ship, which soon brought them to Waterford and a happy bridal. The prince and princess of Waterford always recognized in Hereward their deliverer and best friend, and in their gratitude wished him to dwell with them always. But the hero's roving and daring temper forbade his settling down, but rather urged him on to deeds of arms in other lands, where he quickly won a renown second to none. Robin Hood Among the earliest heirlooms of the Anglo-Saxon tongue are the songs and legends of Robin Hood and his merry outlaws, which have charmed readers, young and old, for more than six hundred years. These entertaining stories date back to the time when Chaucer wrote his Canterbury Tales, when the minstrel and scribe stood in the place of the more prim and precise modern printed book. The question of whether or not Robin Hood was a real person has been asked for many years, just as a similar question has been asked about William Tell and others whom every one would much rather accept on faith. It cannot be answered by a brief yes or no, even though learned men have pored over ancient records and have written books on the subject. According to the general belief, Robin was an outlaw in the reign of Richard I, when in the depths of Sherwood Forest he entertained one hundred tall men, all good archers, with the spoil he took. But he suffered no woman to be oppressed or otherwise molested, poor men's goods he spared, abundantly relieving them with that which by theft he got from abbeys and houses of rich carls. Consequently Robin was an immense favorite with the common people. This popularity extended from the leader to all the members of his hardy band. God save Robin Hood and all his good yeomanry is the ending of many old ballads. The clever archer who could outshoot his fellows, the brave yeoman inured to blows, and the man who could be true to his friends through thick and thin were favorites for all time, and they have been idolized in the persons of Robin Hood and his merry outlaws. One of the best-known stories of this picturesque figure of early English times is that given by Sir Walter Scott in Ivanhoe, concerning the archery contest during the rule or misrule of Prince John, in the absence of Richard from the kingdom. Robin Hood, under the assumed name of Loxley, boldly presents himself at a royal tournament at Ashby, as competitor for the prize in shooting with the longbow. From the eight or ten archers who enter the contest, 
the number finally narrows down to two. Hubert, a forester in the service of one of the king's nobles, and Loxley, or Robin Hood. Hubert takes the first shot in the final trial of skill, and lands his arrow within the inner ring of the target, but not exactly in the center. "'You have not allowed for the wind, Hubert,' said Loxley, "'or that had been a better shot.' So saying, and without showing the least anxiety to pause upon his aim, Loxley stepped to the appointed station, and shot his arrow as carelessly in appearance as if he had not even looked at the mark. He was speaking almost at the instant the shaft left the bowstring, yet it alighted in the target two inches nearer to the white spot which marked the center than that of Hubert. "'By the light of heaven,' said Prince John to Hubert, "'and thou suffer that runagate knave to overcome thee. Thou art worthy of the gallows.' Hubert had but one set speech for all occasions. "'And your highness were to hang me,' he said. "'A man can do but his best. Nevertheless, my grandsire drew a good bow.' The foul fiend on thy grandsire and all his generation, interrupted John. Shoot, knave, and shoot thy best, or it shall be worse for thee. Thus exhorted, Hubert resumed his place, and not neglecting the caution which he had received from his adversary, he made the necessary allowance for a very light air of wind, which had just risen, and shot so successfully that his arrow alighted in the very center of the target. A hey, Hubert, a hey, Hubert, shouted the populace more interested in a known person than in a stranger. In the clout, in the clout, a eh, Hubert for ever. Thou canst not mend that shot, Loxley, said the prince, with an insulting smile. I will notch his shaft for him, however, replied Loxley. And letting fly his arrow, with a little more precaution than before, it lighted right upon that of his competitor, which it split to shivers. The people who stood around were so astonished at his wonderful dexterity that they could not even give vent to their surprise in their usual clamor. "'This must be the devil, and no man of flesh and blood,' whispered the yeomen to each other. "'Such archery was never seen since a bow was first bent in Britain.' "'And now,' said Loxley, "'I will crave your grace's permission to plant such a mark as is used in the north country, and welcome every brave yeoman who shall try a shot at it to win a smile from the bonny lass he loves best.' Loxley thereupon sets up a willow wand, six feet long and as thick as a man's thumb. Hubert is forced to decline the honor of taking part in such a trial of archery skill, but his rival easily splits the wand at a distance of three hundred feet and carries off the prize. Even Prince John, in admiration of Loxley's skill, lost for an instant his dislike to his person. These twenty nobles, he said, which with the bugle thou hast fairly won, are thine own. We will make them fifty, if thou wilt take livery and service with us as a yeoman of our bodyguard, and be near to our person, for never did so strong a hand bend a bow, or so true an eye direct a shaft. Loxley, however, declares that it is impossible for him to enter the prince's service, generously shares his prize with the worthy Hubert, and retires once more to his beloved haunts among the lights and shadows of the good Greenwood. End of Hero Myths of the British Race End of The Age of Chivalry by Thomas Bullfinch